You know, for a series that is mostly remembered for its unparalleled gore and violence, people often overlook the fact that Berserk is a story about the human mind as well. From the very outset, the thing that pulls us in is Guts's never give up attitude towards everything in life, especially when it comes to fighting literal demons like apostles. We then shift to Griffith's everything is in the palm of my hands mentality with which he tries to win the throne, and the clash between these two philosophies is what ends up creating the main conflict of the story. Well, that and what Griffith did to Casca, but we've spoken about that enough on this channel. The real twist in Berserk's tale comes when Guts meets the witches Flora and Shirke, and learns that mind doesn't influence matter, it maketh matter itself. The human consciousness is deeply linked to the spiritual happenings of the astral world, and we're here to break down all of that for you. So this is how Berserk uses Jungian psychology to establish a permanent connection between the astral world and the mind for its insane storytelling. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means an awful lot. Thank you, let's begin. Collective Consciousness and the Unconscious Mind how Jung's school of psychology forms the basis for the astral world and its inhabitants. If you're one of those people who introduce themselves to a stranger as an introvert or an extrovert, you have Carl Jung to thank for showing you what you are. Jung is, without question, one of the most important contributors to the field of human psychology. Not only was he one of the first psychiatrists to identify and label the personality types of introversion and extroversion, he managed to explain what a déjà vu is through his theory on synchronicity, and he is known as the father of analytical psychology. Basically, our understanding of the human mind wouldn't be close to where it is today if it wasn't for this man, but what Berserk applies to its universe is one of his foundational theories about the human mind, the collective consciousness. From chapters 201 to 203, we get what we like to call Magic 101 for Berserk, as Flora and Shirke break down the many aspects of the astral and physical worlds. See, for starters, Berserk doesn't have just two worlds, it has three, the physical world where we live, the astral world where the monsters live, and the ever-elusive realm of ideas, which we will get into in a moment. The reason why Guts and his party could so keenly sense creatures from the astral realm, which was uncommon in the world these days, was the brand of sacrifice seared into Guts and Casca's flesh. Guts and Casca resided in the interstice as the branded pair, and by hanging around them long enough, Isidro, Farnese, and Serpico had been sensitized to it. Shirke then explains that the reason that they could see and perceive astral creatures like trolls in Puck and Ivalira as physical beings was because of this sensitization, but the way she frames it is what links it to the mind. She says that long ago, it was quite common for humanity to believe in the existence of astral creatures, and so they could interact with them in the same way that Guts and his party do. Over the years, even though humanity's interaction with the astral world has reduced, their belief in it remains hardwired into their memories, passed down from generation to generation. Isidro takes this to mean that if they just stop believing in the weird stuff, then the daily monster attacks they face will stop, but that's when Shirke brings in Jungian psychology. She calls him vulgar first, then explains that there is a thing called the subconscious that humans cannot control. We believe what she's referring to here is the idea of the collective unconscious. According to Jung, the unconscious mind of every human being shared certain mental concepts and basic instincts that linked humanity on that level as a collective. In Jung's view, human instinct was innate to all people. When cornered in a life or death situation, most of us would immediately default to the fight or flight response. Similarly, there are certain archetypal figures and roles that have been hard-coded into humanity humanity's unconscious mind, which makes them respond to it in a certain way on instinct. For example, the archetype of a wise old man is why people tend to listen to elderly advice. The archetype of a great mother embodies the very concept of motherhood. You get the drill. Now if you take this idea and apply it to astral creatures in the world of Berserk, it makes perfect sense why humanity can no longer sense or perceive these creatures. If these mental archetypes of pixies and unicorns was overwritten by something more practical, dogmatic, and rigid, like, say, the Holy Sea, then it would be easier for humans to forget that they are capable of spiritual perception. Only by harnessing their ethereal bodies that are embodied by their ego can they become capable of spiritual perception. And she later goes on to explain that magic is possible entirely because of the power of the mind. When Shirke protects the church of Enoch Village from a troll invasion, she explains what we just told you about spiritual
spiritual perception to the church's priest, and then goes on to explain how she can summon the four elemental kings. According to Shirke, a church is nothing more than a sanctuary for humans to commune with spirits and angels. But while the Holy See has encouraged their adherents to erect stone walls to host their hollow idols within, a mage constructs that sanctuary within her mind by casting her luminous body into the astral world. Spirits are not of this world, and so to perceive them, you must hone your mind into perceiving them. You can achieve this by casting your luminous body out of yourself. This luminous body is also interchangeably called the ego of the flesh in the series, and yes, ego is used here in its psychoanalytical sense. She also states that for those who only exist as ideas, the mind is all we can use to perceive them at all. And since the world of ideas is the soul of the origin of existence, perceiving the truth of life can only be achieved through the mind. So, in a way, the astral world itself only exists thanks to the collective unconscious of mankind, and this is pretty much confirmed in the lost chapter of Berserk. Chapter 83 is where we get to see the guy pulling all the strings from behind the scenes. Except, it isn't a guy, and the strings are the literal threads of fate. The collective unconscious is the astral world, and its creatures are archetypes that have persisted as legends and fables. The idea of evil, canonically, only appears at the end of chapter 82. Miura removed the chapter it actually has any dialogue in from his official continuity because he felt it gave too much away. While we do take this chapter to be canon on our channel, we do get where he was coming from because the idea of evil basically tells us that heaven and hell aren't real and it's all in our minds, bros. Well, Kind of, anyway. When Griffith descends into the depths of the abyss and encounters the massive, heart-shaped, and multi-eyed lump of flesh that is the idea of evil, he immediately thinks it's God. God then welcomes Griffith and answers his questions about the abyss, giving a very Jungian explanation for its existence, all things considered. The idea states that all humans have within them a collective consciousness that links each of them without even their knowledge, and that the idea itself was the darker reflection of that consciousness. Right off the bat, it establishes itself as the idea of evil, pun intended, that we all carry within our hearts and minds. Not every human being is evil by nature, but every human being does have the propensity to do evil things. The idea was born from the many reasons that humanity craved to justify their meaningless existence in the grand scheme of things, which, when dumbed down into normal speak, translates to, humans are so messed up they literally thought up hell and an evil god who uses cause and effect to keep them miserable. The idea then goes on to talk about its own terribly human nature tells Griffith to do as he wants to, yada yada, but even if you ignore the fact that this practically confirms Mura was a young head, then we also have a canonical explain of the collective unconscious coming into play in Berserk for you as well. The prophecy of the Falcon of Light. That shining white falcon flying over a war-torn midland and promising all those who believed in God that their desired savior would arrive soon could only have been experienced on the scale that it was experienced on by being sent through the collective unconscious. Belief seems to play a component in it as well, as people like Guts and Farnese, who do not believe in God, seem to have not received the Falcon of Light dream, but quite a few people did, otherwise Falconia wouldn't be filled to bursting with humans and apostles alike. When Griffith triggers the great roar of the astral world, he brings the archetypes of astral creatures into the physical world, which is evidenced by the dialogue in chapter 306. Berserk is a story that is primarily set in a medieval European time period, and so most of the creatures you see in the story are from western folklore. You see trolls, goblins, dragons, brownies, a being that's supposed to be the Loch Ness monster, we think, and also a headless knight charging down a street full of people that are running away from him for the sake of their lives. These are all mythical archetypes that have endured in European fables and folklore for millennia, and Miura cleverly uses that, combines it with the imaginative power of humanity, and handily explains why the Great Roar finally gave mankind its greatest desire. Fantasia. Marvelous Verdict! But we're sorry to cut short your desire for more on this topic because that's gonna have to be it for this video. Carl Jung and Kentaro Miura are both figures who have had massive impacts in their professional fields and the world in general, so it was a lot of fun to work on a video that explored the confluence of their collective genius. Berserk is a story that focuses on Guts' bodily struggle against Griffith, the God Hand, and Demon Kind, but in amongst all the struggling we can often forget that it is also a story about the human mind. It exposes the 
the dark underbelly of humanity by exposing their propensity to commit evil acts, and even Guts's main struggle these days seems to be keeping his consciousness together. Ever since he started using the Berserker armor, Guts hasn't just been living on borrowed time, his mind has been put through inhuman amounts of stress and malice. The only reason he's been able to survive this long without killing a friend or two is because of either Shirke or the Moonlight Boy, but now that each of them seems to be out of his reach, Guts's mind is what becomes his weakest point, because if he loses control on board the seahorse, it will spell certain doom for everyone on the boat. So that's our two cents on the astral world of Berserk and the connection this story has to the human mind. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments section down below, and we'll see you guys in the next video.